Uh, it's a uh, vacuum cleaner for the keyboard. Oh. Oh. But LinkedIn actually did not like this picture. They're like, Matt, you can't include this in your course because you're holding a gun. I'm like, I'm literally not. Uh, <laughs> but thankfully, I had one of me just going like this, and we just swapped it out. Um, but they're like, yeah, we're not, we're not that OK with you having this picture in your course. I'm like, fine. <laughs> so all I was doing was uh, demonstrating Azure AI Vision's background removal capabilities. Or, or a brush at the end of the plug, no, but <laughs> but it's really good for uh, for cleaning your keyboard. <laughs> yeah, I don't have an actual freeze ray, so. Well, I'm waiting for you to introduce me, right? I'm letting you. I'm making you aware. Does that also clean down the mouse? Well, ah, it, it will suck up anything that's suck upable. What is your opinion on Dr. Horrible versus Frizo's Freeze Race? I am a big fan of Dr. Horrible. I, it's one of my reoccurring cosplays. I have a full everything. I go around with a giant Bluetooth speaker. I'll get away from you so we don't get double mic. Okay, looks like we're still a little bit ahead of schedule, but everybody's already seated, so might as well kick it off. Um, we are, and I probably should be in the camera, um, so we are lucky to have Matt Eland here with us. He is an MVP of AI on Azure, so you know he knows what he's talking about. Um, and he's been a personal teacher of mine all the way back to when I started in software development. He is a great person to listen to and very active in the local tech scene in Columbus. He is one of the co-organizers of the .NET Central Columbus. The Central Ohio .NET Developers Group. I was close. Um, so yeah. Yeah, he was better at it. I know, that's why I'm telling you to listen to him, not me. Uh, yeah, you just walk out during my talk, my recommendation. Um, so yeah, uh, really excited to have him and give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Mike gave a wonderful, detailed, technical talk on a, a nice research paper. Uh, this is a very different talk. This is not going to be a very detailed technical talk. Uh, this is going to be a ridiculous talk, as the title implies. Uh, so I am Matt Eland. I've been in Columbus for 20 plus years. Uh, it's my tech home, and it's my uh, dream to make it as good of a home as I can for people getting into tech now. So it's great to see so, so many folks here today. Uh, it's great to have this event going on. So uh, thank you for, for, for having this. This is, this is awesome. Uh, I am an AI specialist, actually I'm a senior solutions developer to slash AI specialist at Leading Edge up in Dublin, Ohio. Um, we are sponsoring today's event, which I'm very thankful for us uh, doing. Uh, but we are a uh, consultancy uh, helping clients uh, throughout Columbus and throughout the world uh, with their projects. We do a lot of DevOps transformations, technical debt, project work. Uh, I do a lot of AI work with us, um, and it's a lot of fun. So if you're ever interested in getting into consulting or having a consultancy help you out, uh, come chat with me. I'm happy to hook you up. Uh, but this is about the ridiculous things I do in my spare time. And I was actually really delighted to come here and see all the little bobbleheads uh, in the lobby because what I do is whenever I do a new AI project or book project or course project or whatever, I have a bobblehead to represent that project. And I just kind of keep it on my shelf. Then I'm going to start needing multiple shelves now for these bobbleheads because I'm starting to get a lot of these projects. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about a number of these projects that I've done, um, many of which involve Azure, but not all. However, yes, all of them involve Microsoft technologies in some form or another, uh, even if it's just VS Code. So let's start uh, with that Microsoft MVP thing. So Microsoft says, hey, we're going uh, to recognize people for their key contributions in technical areas. Uh, believe it or not, mine was primarily related to the movie Die Hard. Uh, so <laughs> uh, fa uh, rewind back to 2021, and I was on the couch, and I was cruising Reddit, and I came across a meme about Die Hard and it being a Christmas movie. And I'd known my wife for about 10 years at that point. I said, hey, honey, uh, what do you think about Die Hard? Is it a Christmas movie? Is it not? We've never had this conversation. She's like, why the heck would it be considered a Christmas movie? I'm like oh no, we're having this conversation. And so I pled my case of why it is a Christmas movie, and she said why it isn't a Christmas movie and why I should be locked up. Um, and normally we would have laughed and moved on and watched TV and whatever was next, right? But the day before, I had actually passed the Azure AI Fundamentals certification. And on that certification, they covered uh, automated machine learning with Azure. Okay? And so I'm like, wait a minute. This is a machine learning problem. This is a classification problem. 
if I can put together a data set of movies, I can have a machine learning model tell me whether or not Die Hard should be considered a Christmas movie. And so I spent my Halloween weekend of 2021 doing just that. I built a data set of movies. I fed it to Azure's automated machine learning. I said, hey, I'm trying to do a classification task. And what you do is you just say, hey, uh, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do a classification experiment. Here's my data set. Here are the columns I care about. Here's the compute resource I want you to use. Go throw data science at the wall and see what sticks. At the moment, I wasn't a uh, data scientist. I was just starting that journey of getting deep into machine learning. And so I didn't know the difference between logistic regression and linear regression, for example. Right? But Azure knew those things. And it knew how to transform my data to get the best results. And what it did is it said, hey, Matt, I tried these 30 models that, 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 uh, uh, on your data. And here's the best performing one. And here's a bunch of metrics that say it's the best performing one and the things that it's not very good at. And this gave me a whole lot to Google, by the way. Uh, sorry, it's an Azure event. This gave me a whole lot to Bing. Uh, and so <laughs> I learned a whole lot of data science terms from this, right? And I was able to say, okay, well, this is, this is good. And my first models weren't performing very well. And so I, I learned a lot about the data science process and cleaning up your data and improving your data and just getting things better. And ultimately, I came up with a model that was actually pretty reliable and pretty performant. And so I said, fine. Well, this model knows a lot about movies and movies that are Christmas movies and non-Christmas movies. It knows nothing about Die Hard. So now I'm going to give it some JSON representing the movie Die Hard. I'm going to have it predict the value of the is Christmas movie column. And it came back with a one. In other words, yippee ki -yay, Die Hard's a Christmas movie, right? <laughs> Second movie is also a Christmas movie. Uh, I didn't look at Die Hard 3. I don't because think I... also Christmas in July and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this was this is Die Hard, and yeah, it, so I, that was my weekend. And I am expecting the Nobel Peace Prize to come my way sometime, but <laughs> it hasn't come my way. I'm wondering, it, it, maybe it went to Microsoft instead? I'm not sure. Uh, well, we're still working on that Nobel Peace Prize thing. So this actually wasn't the first machine learning experiment I ever did. The first machine learning experiment I ever did was because I liked to sleep in. And I hated waking up in the morning and having to scrape off my car. But even more, I hated waking up in the morning and finding out I didn't need to scrape off my car. And so I trained a machine learning regression model predict, to predict the number of minutes I'd need to spend scraping off my windshield based on the prior night's forecast and values that I manually entered every morning based on how much time it took me to defrost my windshield. It took me three months to come up with a good data set for my windshield in my parking spot at my apartment, but I had a valid model that was usable for me for about half a week. <laughs> because the next thing that happened is I suddenly got paralyzed and I couldn't drive anymore. And by the time I could drive again, we had a garage. <laughs> but still, I learned a lot about machine learning in that process, right? Uh, so that was my first machine learning experiment. Let me talk to you about my first AI experiment. My dad got me a book that was full of all sorts of different AI algorithms. And in this book was a, a something on genetic algorithms, which is a flavor of reinforcement learning. And I thought it was so cool to be able to represent life with, in terms of genes, in terms of preferences, A and B and C, and evolving basically an optimal set of genes to solve a problem. It's kind of an abstract way of thinking, and nowadays we tend to do more of this with neural nets than genetic algorithms, but I was still very interested in it. At the time, I was suffering a lot from depression, and my world was really my room. And outside, there were squirrels and rabbits and my dogs and the yard. And so I said, well, fine, let's simulate that. Let's build a simulation of a squirrel and a dog and a tree and an acorn and a rabbit. And the rabbit's gonna wander around randomly, the dog's gonna stay put, and can we train the squirrel to go get the acorn and get to the tree without getting near the dog and dying. And so <coughs> I represented the attractiveness of each tile in terms of genes. So a squirrel would start out randomly saying, hey, I value tiles that are near the rabbit. I value tiles that are near the acorn. And this basically let it build a heat map of what tiles it liked. And so you look at the squirrel, it's gonna go to the tile that's most attractive to it. And it sort of follows it like a, like a little marble following a, a curve of a hill. And so I was able to evolve these things using genetics and mutation and crossbreeding and things like that. And you have enough generations and you have a squirrel that's now able to say, hey, I need to avoid the dog, go towards the acorn, and then go towards the tree. 
and you give it a fitness function. You say, hey, here's, here's what makes a good squirrel versus a bad one. If you live a long time, you're a good squirrel. If you get to eat the acorn, you're a great squirrel. If you get to, eat, to get back to the tree with the acorn, you're a fantastic squirrel. I'm gonna penalize you if you get killed by the dog. <laughs> and that fitness function is what helps it find what's, a, what's an optimal solution versus a suboptimal, okay? And this worked. It took maybe 10, 20 generations for it to find a good solution. And I was about ready to just say, okay, cool. I did some genetic algorithms. Let's move on to the next project. But then I said, wait a minute. What happens if I modify that fitness function to give the squirrel a lot of extra brownie points if the rabbit happens to die? Squirrel can't attack anything. Shouldn't do anything. And yet, it was actually able to find a solution to this problem that I didn't think could be solved. And this squirrel evolved into a herding squirrel that gradually would herd that rabbit towards the dog. The dog would eat it. The rabbit would say, okay, my job is done. I'm going to go eat my, my stuff. So it solved a problem I didn't even know was, was possible to solve. And that's what got me so excited about uh, artificial intelligence back in 2004, 2005, something like that. Also, dying to the grunts in Half-Life really got me excited about it as well. <coughs> so let's talk about game-related AI. Uh, anybody ever heard of the pandemic? Yes. Okay, some people here have heard of the pandemic. Pandemic hit and I didn't have people around to play board games with and that made me sad. And so I was thinking about my favorite game, One Night Ultimate Werewolf. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I could build an AI to play One Night Ultimate Werewolf with me. Because all it is, is building a probabilistic model of, hey, I think this player here might have the werewolf card, or I think this might have happened, and what can I lie as? What can I bluff as? So can I build an AI that's going to fool me as a human player? Is it going to be able to tell me a compelling lie? And so nothing could go wrong teaching an AI to lie, right? <laughs> so I built a probability model of, the, of the, the game space. I said, hey, this player knows that they started as a werewolf. They know that no other player was the werewolf, so the werewolf card must be in the middle. They did get to look at this card in the middle. They saw it was a seer. Oh, you can claim that you were the seer, and you saw a werewolf and a blank, based on probabilities. Right? And so I used the boringest technology in the world, probabilities <laughs> and statistics, to train an AI to lie to me. And it worked really well. And I'm actually uh, very happy to share that I get to revisit this experiment and add in large language models to actually add in text and have it understand me and tell me lies convincingly. Uh, and this gets to be featured in a new edition of Game AI Uncovered, sorry for the quality of the photo, uh, coming out in 2026. So I'm really excited that this gets to be included in that, uh, in that book. So uh, very happy about that. So I've uh, been working on that recently and that's a lot of fun project to work on. All right, anybody here ever heard of television? Okay, uh, I've heard of television as well. Uh, I like television and I have historically liked Doctor Who. Uh, Doctor Who has, <laughs> that is from my wedding, and no, I didn't wear that at the altar, though I did think about it. Uh, <laughs> Doctor Who has maybe not been as good as it was before, and pardon my phrasing, but I started thinking about data analytics and what would it take to make Doctor Who great again? Again, pardon my phrasing. <laughs> And so I used a data analytics experiment to say, what makes a good episode of Doctor Who versus a bad episode of Doctor Who? What are the contributing factors? Okay? And so I took this data set of Doctor Who episodes and their ratings and their viewerships and things like that, and I started looking at, well, okay, is it the composer? Is it the producer? Is it whether it occurs in the past, the present, the future? Is it that it occurs on Earth or in space or in the TARDIS or wherever it is, right? And I looked at all these different factors and I built a principal component analysis model to see what are the major factors. And what I ultimately came up with was a pair of major recommendations. My first recommendation was, dude, we gotta get back David Tennant, because David Tennant is awesome, right? <laughs> now he's not my favorite doctor, I love Matt Smith, I just relate a little bit more with him, but that's okay. The model said David Tennant. The model also said uh, Russell T. Davies, okay? So those are my recommendations, like, well, yeah, that's never happening. We don't that they, those folks have moved on. But I went ahead and I presented this a couple years ago at Sci-Fi DevCon. And I said, hey, here's my recommendations. Now, I don't mean to brag, but about a half year later, Disney announces, hey, we're bringing back, <laughs> we're bringing back David Tennant. We're bringing back uh, uh, Stephen Moffat. I'm like, hey, all right, all right, this is good. So um, I'm not saying they watched my presentation. They totally watched my presentation. 
I kid, I kid. Disney don't sue me. We all know that they don't listen to the fans anyway. <laughs> Uh, so I have a dog. Uh, he's a wonderful dog, and in the winter we like to play hockey in the basement. So I'll, I'll shoot street hockey balls at the, uh, at the goalpost, and he'll bark at them, right? And then he'll help me find them, right? He doesn't chase them. He just help, helps me find them. But every so often we'll get these balls lost in our basement. And I was like, this is a pain. Well, wait a minute. I can solve this with Azure. Because of course I can, right? <laughs> and so what I did is I took a bunch of pictures of, of these balls. And I trained a machine. Uh, sorry, I trained an Azure AI custom vision object detection model around them. I drew a little bounding box around all the balls in these images from all over the house, but particularly in my basement. And I trained a custom uh, object detection model using Azure AI Vision. And now I'm able to give it any picture, and it says, "Hey, Matt, here it is, right over here behind the water heater." I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, very effective, very good accuracy on that model. Here's another use of Azure AI Vision. Again, another use of custom vision. Um, last summer, I trained a pair of machine learning models to beat me at rock, paper, scissors. Uh, one of those models was using Azure AI custom vision uh, to classify my motions as either you know, rock, paper, or scissors. Right? I trained it based on other people's hands, uh, hand images, but it worked uh, very effectively on mine. I also have another model uh, that's a non-visual model that basically looked at the last three games and what I did and whether I won or whether I lost to predict what I was about to do the next game. And the net result of these two models was I had something that could interpret what I did and I also had something that could predict ahead of time what I would do so it would beat me. Um, and so that's the story of how Matt skipped class last summer at, uh, at Franklin University and got an A on his project. <laughs> um, but it was really effective. Uh, shameless plug time. Uh, if you are curious about computer vision, Azure custom vision, I actually just released a course with LinkedIn uh, last week. Uh, so check that out. It's related to the Azure AI Engineer AI 102 certification. It's also going to be helpful if you're going for the Azure AI 900 AI Fundamental certification. Uh, but it's free on LinkedIn Learning if you're a subscriber for that. And I am amazed at the LinkedIn platform because it's got one and a half thousand bookmarks already. I'm like, Holy cow, this is a specialty course that released last week. But LinkedIn Learning is awesome. Uh, Leading Edge is also awesome. We have something com coming up called Edgevation Days where we all get to build fun projects. And I'm on a team of people who are building something called a mocking mirror uh, that will build, basically use computer vision to analyze whoever comes up to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the mirror and say, oh, you're wearing a lovely dress tonight. Uh, or maybe it uses custom vision to say, oh, it's my coworker Terry. Well, let's, let's mock Terry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's a project we have coming up in a couple weeks using all these Azure AI technologies. Um, let's talk about other things I do that are questionable uses of my judgment in Azure AI technologies. Um, I love my dog. He's a wonderful dog. He's very loud. He barks a lot, but he's a cute guy. But when I think about his, his life and what I can do to help his life and improve his quality of life, it, his life really comes down to a few things. He's looking at things. He's barking. He's listening to my words somewhat. He kind of responds to commands sometimes, like, you want to go on a walk? Or, oh, do you want a treat? You know, he understands what I'm saying. And he also can infer a little bit from tone based on what I'm saying, right? Good, bad, that kind of things. And he also has his own creative expressions. And I said, well, hey, let's make my dog's life easier. And so I used Azure AI to do that, OK? So I used Azure AI services with computer vision. So I can take an image and look out the window and say, what does my dog see? I can use text-to-speech. So if it sees a rabbit or a squirrel in the yard, it can say, woof, 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 I saw a squirrel. Woof, 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 I saw a rabbit. That kind of thing. Squirrel! Yep, there you <laughs> uh, Speech-to-text. I can speak to this thing, and it uses the microphone of the system to understand my words, to take my words from a, a WAV file into just a string of text. You can use conversational language understanding to classify those words into an intent, much like uh, she who shall not be named from Amazon does when you're talking to, to your thing. So you're like, hey, tell me a joke, that kind of thing, right? Uh, and then the last thing I added to this was Azure OpenAI. So it can actually respond intelligently when I say, hey, you want to go on a walk or tell me a joke about PHP developers, something like that, right? Um, and I put all this together into this little kit with a stuffed dog, a speaker, and a webcam with googly eyes on it, okay? And <laughs> I... Went to so many conferences last year and presented about this. I'm really, really shocked that TSA didn't just disappear me because I carried this thing around in a little gun case. <laughs> last September, I was walking around OSU campus with a gun case and nobody asked me about it. It was weird. Uh, but this is what I do with my life. 
but it got me, this project got me thinking. I'm like, wait a minute. This, is, this, this thing is kind of a joke for teaching, but I could actually build a larger AI system out of this. And so I, of course, am Batman, it's well documented, uh, and I decided to build the Bat computer. And I can say, hey, what are the major APIs or capabilities I could add into this thing to have an intelligent conversation with an Alfred agent and say, like, hey, what bat suit should I wear tomorrow, or, or where is the Riddler likely to be hiding around Gotham City? Right? The common tasks I deal with on a daily basis. Um, and when you think about these large language models that we deal with, they have their limitations, right? They were trained on, on data that's obsolete by the time you're using the data, right? So some ways that we have of working with that are is you can use an Azure AI search um, resource that's been, that's indexed a lot of knowledge base articles that you, uh, you have available to you. For example, I've trained it on my blogs and it's able to give me references to things in my blogs on, on how things should work. Uh, but that's just one piece of information. You can also use retrieval augmented generation to go out and query for new data if you have one source of data. So you can query a database or Bing search or something like that. But if you have a whole lot of different, different sources or different data sources, then you are starting to get into AI orchestration capabilities. And Microsoft just released something called Semantic Kernel, uh, which is very similar to LangChain in concept. Uh, and that works with AI orchestration. So you can, you can sort of integrate all these different capabilities. And so I started doing that with this, this, this thing. And I started saying, okay, well, here's the weather. Here's the conference agenda for this conference I'm about to go to. Here's the uh, you know, details for the city. Here's my wardrobe. Here's all these things. And what I basically wound up building is something that I'm lovingly called Hat GPT. <laughs> but I could say, hey, what should I wear tomorrow? And it says, well, based on your wardrobe, based on the local weather, I think you should do this. And it does that based on combining different skills that I gave it. It creates an automated plan that says, I think I can get the weather, I think I can get your wardrobe, I think I can get your geolocation, and I can combine all these things together to give you a coherent answer on this, right? And that's a ridiculous use of it, but that's what I'm all about, right? Uh, a more, uh, a less ridiculous use would be something around maybe answering a question about your quarter one earnings at your organization or helping you identify leads for upselling or something like that, right? But I, I do the ridiculous, that's what I am about. Uh, so, Let's talk about how to make you all mad data scientists, okay? Uh, so I have a, a set of recommendations for you that I would like to give you. Uh, first, obligatory Seth Roth, Seth Roth slide, because you know, he's a good guy, uh, he loves his books, really does. Uh, I recommend that you learn a lot about, uh, a little, learn a little about a lot of things, right? The more things you know of, the more you can go off later on and search and expand your knowledge, right? Uh, if you are somebody who doesn't feel very confident in an area, go off and follow a tutorial, right? Find a guided tutorial. For example, if you like classification and machine learning, you want to get started with that, Kaggle.com is a wonderful data science community, and they will walk you through the most morbid uh, example I can imagine, which is basically predicting if someone would have lived or died on the Titanic. But there's so many tutorials about that one experiment alone. Uh, again, very morbid, very odd, but that's a standard data science thing. Uh, I think you should always take a look at what interests you. So for example, Doctor Who <laughs> interests me a lot, and I was like, okay, well, what makes a good episode versus a bad one? Or sometimes I'm like, I'd really like to play with machine learning. Oh, Die Hard, let's use that. Or, oh, Semantic Kernel's really interesting, what could I do with that? Right? So find something that interests you and go build a project out of it, a really small project, okay? Uh, next, uh, try to do the craziest thing you can imagine while still keeping it a very small experiment. My uh, automating my dog with Azure AI services talk came out of this idea of what do I know that I can teach to people and what's the craziest thing I could send to a conference that they might actually accept? And <laughs> a lot of them accepted it. That still weirds me out. Actually, there was a year, 2022, I had at least one week of that year for hotel rooms paid by conferences to talk to people about Die Hard. I'm like, what even is my life right now? <laughs> it was great. Um, you're gonna make mistakes, that's okay. That's why you're playing with ridiculous things and not customer data, right? Um, you're going to run into to dead ends and you're gonna learn from those. The number of models I had for Die Hard that didn't perform very well was very high. And that taught me a little bit more about the ways I needed to change my experiment, to change my data source, to change what I was trying. Right? That experiment made me into a data scientist more than anything else did. So don't be discouraged by your mistakes. That's just signs that you're trying something and rubbing into obstacles. Just adapt and try something else. Find other people who are, who are interested in these things or are farther along than these things. Uh, going back to Die Hard, 
I had reached a, a, an issue with my experiment. I just, I, I'm not sure I can get past this performance threshold. And then I saw just a random post on LinkedIn. Someone was talking about the curse of dimensionality. I'd never heard of this term before, but it was exactly the problem I was dealing with because I had so many columns and not enough data to support it. And that led me down the road of discovery to make things better. Most important recommendation I have for you, have fun, right? This stuff should be fun. Learning new things is fun. Sharing about new things is fun. Um, don't put a lot of expectations on yourself. You're not required to finish your projects, right? Uh, the bat computer, the best thing it can do right now is tell me what hat to wear. That's okay, right? It taught me about the limits of these technologies and how to teach them to other people and how to get better. And that's okay, that's what you're looking for. So uh, go build small, ridiculous things. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for organizing the conference. This is uh, gonna be a lot of fun. What questions do you have for me about the random crazy things that I do? What you got? What were the predictors that went into the first model that you wrote for Christmas? I really have to know. So the predictors that went into the first model for Die Hard. Uh, Die Hard is actually a, a class imbalance problem where you have much more movies that are non-Christmas movies than Christmas movies. Sure. So the earliest model that I trained just said nothing's a Christmas movie and it had 99% accuracy. Yeah, because you're out. Yeah. <laughs> so really there were no, there really no were, were no important predictors. But once I solved the class imbalance issue, the most important uh, predictor was the time of the year and then the genre. Okay. Yeah. So like what were, just like name five columns that went, like name like five columns that went into that. I'm just fair. Like how many columns went into it and then which ones were the most relevant ones? Because I'm curious, I saw you like, you had an AOC score, or an R, well, I said ROC, which, which was, okay, so you had an ROC curve that was towards the corner, which was made it like a useful model. I was very curious. And then I didn't see the F1 score for mm -hmm. the confusion matrix, but um, yeah, I was just kind of curious, like, what all, what were the parameters that went into that, so that way you could actually determine, you know, that way you're not like, I don't know, like, I didn't see the F1 score, so I don't know how like biased you're, you're your fine. model was because uh, you already you already kind I've of implied that. I've done that model like six, seven times, and it comes up with different different algorithms every time, sure. uh, and slightly different F1 scores and all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, but typically, the most important thing to it at the end is the keywords column. Once I gave it keywords, it said, "Oh, the 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 inclusion of uh, Christmas party, the inclusion of Christmas Eve, the inclusion of holiday." These are good indicators of a Christmas movie. So, what, so you were just using then XG Boost, Random Forest, or Logistic Regression for that then? So Azure Automated Machine Learning will try all those sure. and just see what works well. Um, so yeah, those, those were all some of the models it came up with, but really it just was a, a matter of the dice, of rolling the dice Fair there. Fair enough, yeah. yeah. All right, I was curious, because like, yeah. well, I know AutoML, like, I, well, you could use like, I don't know, grid search cross-validation or whatever crazy yeah. Optimization algorithm that's already in there. Yeah, it's but. it's got a lot of good stuff on there. Azure Azure uses Scikit Learn under the hood, and it, it works really well. What you got, Mike? Yeah, I did want to ask if you were familiar. There is actually a oh sorry yeah there is actually a paper on the um, the uh, werewolf uh, game that you had. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just blanking on the name. But there was actually a paper on using generative AI to specifically play that game between multiple agents. Ah. So I was kind of curious if you'd heard about that. It actually came out last year. I can send it to you if you're curious. Uh, please send that to me. I have, I'm not aware of that. Uh, no. If my title slide with me and the mad scientist coat is is uh, maybe not a good indicator, I, I'm kind of a hack, and that's okay. <laughs> but I, I would be curious to read that that, that paper. That sounds great. And uh, additionally, I, I, on, jumping off of the questions asked by Ray, I was just kind of curious, because it seems more like an anomaly detection problem. I was just kind of curious if you'd consider that as an option as well. Uh, for Die Hard? For Die Hard, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I could see an argument made that for it being an anomaly detection. I, I view Christmas movies more of a, a minority class than an anomaly. Yeah. Um, and fair. my goal was really to play with classification anyway, so that biased me. Totally fair. Yeah. yeah. Easy point. Uh, Philip, what you got? Uh, yeah, when, uh, uh, when you're uh, looking at uh, with uh, determining on which uh, movies are considered Christmas movies, do you look at uh, like the context of the film itself of like it doesn't take place at Christmas time, or do you look at the actual release date of when that movie was uh, 
a waste if I could get up a waste around Christmas time. So that's uh, a gr that's a great question. My process for determining what is and isn't a Christmas movie in my t training data set was to look at the court of popular opinion. So I went out, I used Bing Search, again, thank you Microsoft, uh, and I said, lists of Christmas movies, and I took the top five lists, I compiled a the list of movies that occurred in those lists, and then if something occurred in at least two out of the five, I said, yes, it's a Christmas movie, okay? Um, that excluded a couple of interesting outliers. Um, interestingly enough, of those five uh, lists, all five of them mentioned Die Hard. Four of them had it as a Christmas movie. Uh, one of them said, sorry, John McClane, you're not a Christmas movie. But that didn't really matter because Die Hard wasn't in my training data. So it was kind of an interesting anomaly. What you got? Uh, does the back computer, uh, 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 will the back computer ever be able to make contingency plans? <laughs> will the back computer ever be able to make contingency plans? I actually have contingency plans around the back computer. Uh, but as to, as to whether it can make contingency plans, uh, Nah, I, I'm going to decline to answer at this time for legal reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, could be, that could become bad eventually. No. <laughs> what you got? Uh, how you decide which training model and algorithms for your different uh, um, topics, different projects, and if you switch those algorithms, would it produce different results? So every algorithm that you switch is going to produce a different result in, to some degree or another it, it, for some of the data that it handles versus other parts of the data. Uh, at the time I was doing this diehard experiment for the first time, I didn't know a whole lot about these things. So I let automated ML say, hey, here's the, the models that I tried, here's the ones that, the most, that are the most effective, and then I looked into those. So for me, it wasn't as much model selection. Uh, it was me trying to get past the sheer learning curve of data science, right? You think about all these things you have to learn, the metrics, the models, the process, the tools, the, all these things, right? That's what I like about automated machine learning on Azure is it eases that learning curve for you. Now, before you to take your model and deploy it to production, you absolutely need to understand all those things. <laughs> but I was just trying to have fun with a, with a point of contention with my wife and I, right? Um, so, um, and, and nowadays I understand all those a lot more, and so I understand the ones that I should use and shouldn't use, and you know, the dangers of, say, a random force and things like that, right? We have three minutes, so I'll try to fit a couple more in. The question I have is, how do you get the data that, you, that you're going for? So how do I get the data I'm going for? Um, it depends on what I'm doing. Uh, most of my data sources I'll get from Kaggle because uh, I'm not trying to do anything hugely impactful, hugely uh, meaningful if, if it's wrong, right? Uh, the Doctor Who episodes, that came from Ka Kaggle. Uh, the list of Christmas movies, or the list of movie data was from Kaggle, and then I augmented it with the list of Christmas movies versus not, so I used feature engineering to add a new column there. Um, I have used my own internal data sources uh, for work. I have, and those, those are just data sources we curate as an organization for my clients. Um, I have used uh, data sources I collect via APIs, but you gotta be careful with that because you know, there could be conditions in those APIs, don't use this data for training, that kind of thing, right? Um, and then some of, some of those things I just manually entered in. So my, <laughs> my windshield scraping experiment, that was data entry. When I got to work, I just put in a little Excel sheet, hey, here's how much it took me to scrape my windshield this morning. You yeah, know, that kind of thing. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions toward the back and then bias towards the front earlier? No, okay. Yes, I was wondering that since you've gained more experience as a data scientist, if you were to redo the Die Hard project it, as just a data science project, what would you do differently or how would you, is there a different way you would approach it now? Mm. So I've done the project again a couple times. One of, the, one of the ways I did it again was to use the Python SDK for automated ML. So you don't have to just use the portal. You can actually spin up your resources that way. Um, and that way you get a little bit more control over it, over the models considered and the process and all that stuff. Um, I've also done it with scikit-learn a little bit. Um, I want to do it with ML.net because I'm doing more and more with ML.net nowadays. The hard part about that is the, the effective column wound up being the keywords column. And so that gets into your whole bag of words and text processing. And it, you know, machine learning gets a lot muddier when you get into text, uh, text analysis uh, and, and how you encode that. Uh, but that is something I do want to get back into with ML.net at some point in the future. Um, yeah, it's all a process of learning, right? Just like programming. <laughs>